snoring logo in the background. This is perfect because it covers your face. I didn't do the joke. I'm gonna move it. Look at Logan in the background. Sleeping. I know. It's kind of great, actually. This is a snapshot of the modern family as we whisper. So here's what's funny. Uh, we are going to meet friends for dinner. Why? Why? That doesn't... Turn it up so they can hear us. That... Our volume doesn't affect us. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Are you sure? I'm positive. So I could force someone to make their phone louder by fucking it'll with our volume? Up. It'll pick us up better. No, <laughs> it's not true. That's not true. Did you read that somewhere? Yes. Are you making this shit up? <laughs> okay. You sound like my mom who says if you talk louder on the phone, they could hear you. My mom screams into her cell phone because she doesn't understand technology. And when you said, if I turn up my volume, their volume goes up. That's a, that's, that doesn't make sense. If we turn up the volume on our phone, can't you hear us better? I'm yeah. going to yeah, see, let's, opinions. yeah, yes or no. <laughs> um, thank you for calling see, me. See, it did get louder. She's right. It's because we're, we're no, unconsciously speaking just, louder. Just admit that I'm right. Hey, um. You can never admit it. Snapshot of the modern family. Baby in the back sleeping. We're in a parking lot. And uh, we're about to go to a, a friend's house for dinner. Um, and we want our baby to sleep for like 20 minutes. So uh, we're going to quote unquote make content. Uh, which I, by the way, I hate that word. Make, I, I hate that term, making content. Um, I'm seeing a lot of she's rights coming up in the comments. I'm just putting mm, it out there. Also, I kind of want to say if you're live in this room, shame on you because it's Christmas Eve and you should not be on your phone but be spending time with your family. Well, maybe some people don't like their families. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> shame on you. I'd say come here, come here, be with us on um, Christmas Eve. It's um, the healthier place to be, honestly. We're going to talk about a topic um, that came up the other day. And, you know, a lot of times when I we'll start a conversation uh, that is not recorded and then we'll tag it as... Let's talk about this because we think it could help other people. So, um, someone so who's 12, 12, you're not 12. There's no Maybe. way. Well, it makes, I guess, yeah, today's oh, time. emotionally immature family. See, oh. She's right on that one. I said it's more, it's more healthier, mature they, to be they, they may not literally 12, but they're 12 emotionally. Might be. Might be. Let's crack a window. It's getting hot in here. Okay, let's get to the point. Sorry, guys. So, um, emotional, uh, parents. Emotionally immature parents. So. Yes. Basically. Um, all of our parents, <laughs> basically every boomer. Yeah. So Lindsay Gibson wrote the book, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, right? It came out a while ago. It's a book that I have, I read in grad school. I've recommended it to pretty much every client I've ever worked with. It's phenomenal. And I haven't read it in a while. It's been years. Um, and uh, Glennon Doyle um, and the podcast team at We Can Do Hard Things had her on their podcast the other day and they had a two-part um, conversation with her and so it kind of refreshed it it brought it up for me I brought it into the codependency groups that I run every week and we had a long conversation about it two weeks in a row as well and I came out of my codependency class and I said to John I realized a couple of things so you know m my codependency is my jam I started realizing that can, can I just answer something real quick? Um, as a clinician or a therapist, uh, a lot of uh, people may not know that when we are running groups or in session and we run a retreat, um, so much of that conversation activates uh, things in us where we have revelations. And so the client can be a catalyst to our growth as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I was saying that, you know, I've, I've said for many years that narcissism and codependency are kind of two sides of the same coin. They're fueled by a similar wounding um, the wounding of not enough. And when I was listening to her talk about emotionally immature parents, I realized how much of codependent behaviors, how much of codependency is actually based in emotionally immaturity as well as narcissism. And so I came out and I was saying to you, what's interesting to me is that what that tells me, this isn't a super aha, but what that tells me is that when I am in my codependency, when I'm acting out of my codependency, I am in a state of, of emotional immaturity. Yeah, so describe right? that because people, well, I think when, when you when you see emotional immaturity, people just kind of default to, you know, childlike. That's a, that's a big, that's a big ask. I mean, it's an entire book on what is emotional. Well, it's like just, saying what is codependency. Just broad strokes so people kind of get um, what you're saying. Okay. Well, I can give a couple details. Um, I don't have the notes in front of me. So... 
people who are emotionally immature um, have a really hard time with true intimacy and mm -hmm. so um, they can only go so deep right and so they have st strategies to maintain distance and relationships so if you know somebody or if you are somebody who um, creates drama or conflict or likes to keep things kind of like tit for tat or getting you know going back and forth um, there's a reason for that and that's because when people are going at each other they're not connecting in a deep and intimate way and so it's a way to maintain that that distance right um, people who are emotionally mature for example um, they have a hard time seeing you or anybody's so that could be kids right parents um, um, partners whatever as their own person they purely see other people as mirrors of themselves right and so if you're raised by somebody who's emotionally immature who sees you not as your own complex you know individual but sees you strictly as a mirror to themselves your purpose then becomes making them feel as good about themselves as possible so that you, you kind role. of become the emotional parent yes and right? so many times you become the emotional caretaker right, right. of that adult um, and there's a lot of other things you definitely if you haven't read the book it's really really amazing um, but anyway the conversation you and I were having is how do we in our adult relationships now show up as those emotionally immature people right sure and so what I was saying is if we just take that one nugget which is like the I in my emotional immaturity I stop seeing you as your own individual person your own authentic autonomous being and I simply look at you as how do I use you to make me feel as good about myself as possible yes right so then what I was saying is like how does that show up for you versus how does that show up for me yeah and so now we're tightening the vice by bringing it back to us and our story um, being a little bit vulnerable um, how do you show up emotionally immature and how do I how do you think I show up and of course there's a spectrum right adult children of emotionally immature parents guys that's what we're talking about a couple yes. people asked so how do you think uh, you show up and how do you think I'm trying to think of how so I, show I basically up. said that to me it feels like when I'm at my worst and when you're at your worst yeah right? like that's yeah. when we're at our worst we'll say air quotes but um, thank you Kim for putting that in the chat so when I'm at my worst, when I'm at my most emotionally immature, um, I am withdrawn. Mm. I am distant. Avoidant. I'm avoidant, yeah. right? A runner. Um, and so this is a runner. And so what does that do, though, right? So here's the here's the kind of next layer to that, and then we'll flip it to you. So when I'm in that state what it does is it actually brings up in you your deepest wounding so you and I and not just us people do this all the time yeah. we sought out somebody who actually brings out or brings up or or pours kind of salt in our deepest wounding right um, and why do we do this we do this because our unconscious is trying to heal so we're kind of seeking people out who bring up that wound in order to heal it if if that's kind of what we decide to do so what is that what, my behavior do to you and and by the way that means that and this is not um, romantic or sexy but then that means that relationships um, are challenging because you're attracting the opposite and also you're attracting people probably who may activate you the most I actually think that is romantic and sexy and here's why well well, well it's only romantic and sexy uh, once you are aware of it working through it and kind of peeping yeah. out the other side it's not romantic and sexy if you're not aware of it and, and every day is you know um, struggle feels just like a struggle well yeah. I, I think that once we all look at every relationship in our life as, as an opportunity to learn that is the purpose of relationships is to grow and evolve yeah then to me that is romantic like yeah. I have called you into my life for a purpose it's not about are you gonna be with me forever and ever amen it's just like what is the purpose what is the growth that I've called you into my life to serve not in like a selfish way but I think that's a really beautiful collision kind of way like my unconscious sought you out your unconscious sought me yeah out. no the process of it is beautiful I just wrote a whole thing on this uh, um, someone asks our relationships um, supposed to be hard and I said uh, sometimes I think relationships are uh, or can be one of the greatest catalysts to our growth um, I also don't think that every relationship is supposed to last forever. Mm -hmm. um, I think some relationships are supposed to um, evolve us to a certain point, right? And that was what that relationship was meant to be. Right. Um, I think we all get stuck in the whole happily, happily ever forever. after, mm -hmm. you know, one soulmate forever, that kind of thing. Um, but I do think that what's beautiful about uh, the human, 
I had a burp. Sometimes I throw up a little bit in my mouth. Um, I think when I talk a lot, I get all like acidy and shit. The, one of the beautiful things about the human condition is um, how two people evolve from the collision. So, uh, and I think the, the, the thing is that if it wasn't for love, because love is what anchors us, who would do it, right? And so it's beautiful in that love brings us in. And then once we're in, the relationship becomes a black light to our wounding, our activation, what we need to work on, etc. Many people, and I say uh, many, when, when I say many, I would maybe say most, um, decide to run from the discomfort and activation and pain and struggle and challenge. And so they don't reap the benefits of what a relationship can actually do for you as far as uh, encourage growth and, and healing. I think they could, yeah, they can be really good mirrors. I think that we have to be open to what we see in the reflection though. I think what happens is for a lot of us, we're not open to the reflection because it's too hard or it's too activating or it makes well, the, us defensive because we don't want to see those yucky things about ourselves sometimes. The, the reflection can be subjective and this is the problem, well, sure. right? Because I'm what, saying what, what we see though, not what you're telling me, but what I see in myself. It's, it's, so the reflection is going to be up to the individual because if, mm. I mean, I, I guess people can point it out. I mean, this is, you know, a couple therapists would be very helpful in that. Um, but it's almost like you can't force someone to see they don't see what they oh, no, don't see, not. right? Yeah, of course not. No, I'm just saying that either way, it's not about forcing. It's that many times if I'm too activated by what I'm seeing as far as a reflection back to me, I'm not going to be willing to see it. And so yeah. I'm not going to have that growth opportunity because I'm going to be too defensive and too activated and I'm going to bail or I'm going to blame it on you or I'm not going to take my, you know, own my part. I'm going to shut down, whatever, get defensive. So going back to our topic, Vanessa, um, when she is emotionally immature um, at her worst, she's slamming doors. I'm not slamming she, doors. I've never slammed a door. No, no. I meant I didn't mean literally. I meant, <laughs> I meant you're a runner. You're, you're slamming the door behind you as you bolt out, right? Yes, and Lorene, yes, that's what we're saying. Is that emotionally um, immature, immaturity and codependency are linked. hand in hand. Yeah, and then for me, when I'm at my worst- Well, hang on, before you go there, can I go yeah. back to what I was saying? Yes. Which is, so what I was able to say is when I'm at my worst, when I'm in my, mo my emotional immaturity, when I'm acting out my codependency, I am acting in ways that are distant, putting up walls, um, you know, pushing you away. And what does that do? That activates in you the wound of, I'm making you feel like I don't love you, like yeah. I don't desire you, like yeah. you're not lovable. So pouty, um, Well, that's moody. your response to that. Yeah, so my response, uh, which then is emotionally mature, is right. pouty, moody. Um, withdrawn, you withdrawn, go emotionally silent. Um, but also like uh, feeling rejected and hurt, you know? Well that, yes, of course, yeah, but yeah. that's not to me. No, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. So, so my, my re reaction to her is that. Yeah, and so then when you are in that state right so it this is the circle right so when you're in your activation state so when you're at your worst right air quotes when you're in your emotionally immature state when you're acting out your codependency you act out in a way that essentially in nonverbal ways you're attempting to get me to engage with you so you do this thing where you you go quiet you go cold energetically you kind of like you start to pout so you do these things. But I don't things. think I'm consciously using that as a tactic. Sure, I'm not consciously right, using right, mine right. as a tactic okay, either. Yeah, That's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm like when we're at our worst, right? Um, and so when you do that, the hope in that is that I will lean in and I will caretake and I will be like, sure. what's wrong? Sure. Are you okay? Sure. Let me soothe you. But what it does to me, it, make you run. it pours the salt in my wound, yeah. which is the, the expectation that I have to take care of you, right? Sure. So coming from my emotionally immature you know side um, being raised by somebody who I was the caretaker of the needs so what that does is activates that wound in me which then makes me run further so you guys get the gist here right we got the circle this pattern in, going a, on. in a nutshell it flips the magnet by turning two adults into 12 year olds that's kind of what it does so the her 12 year old toddlers yeah or, well, <laughs> even younger I just I think I, I think I said 12 because yeah. someone said 12 in the room but um, so her 12 year old runs my 12 year old wants to be you know grabs her leg so that's and then they um actually both pour salt on each other's wounds mm -hmm. so it's just an interesting um topic and this is the kind of conversations you have in couples uh counseling um so what do you do with this is so one 
I guess we're just gonna talk until Logan wakes up. Uh, she might not ever wake up. Uh, what, we, what you do with this is the, the awareness of it, right? So us talking about it and me being aware, oh, this is what's happening in me when I am emotionally mature. I just saw someone walk by. What if we get like jacked, carjacked? I mean, we're up, we're, we're we'd have a safe video place on it. and it's broad daylight. But it was just, I don't, and then um, 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 Vanessa would um, investigate and explore what's happening within her. So when we talk about it, um, we are learning more about each other and what's happening uh, that we're not aware of. It's so like putting it on the table, right? And saying, oh, this is what's happening. Right. And then there's the ownership piece. Well, right? okay, so I'm glad you ended up the ownership piece because what I was going to say is, Similar to the codependency work, the cover, re, sorry, codependency recovery work that I do with all my clients and in my groups, you know, a lot of this is about it's owning your part, right? It's a hundred percent about radical ownership, and so it's about realizing how your codependency presents itself, how your emotional maturity presents itself, like how do you behave when you're at your worst? And again, I keep giving air quotes for that because um, I don't want it to sound too like shamey, right? and then starting to notice those behaviors and then starting to unpack and change those behaviors, right? And so, for example, I'll give you a really good, like, in the moment example. You want to this? No, I'm good. good. Earlier today, I was in work mode mentally, right? Um, I was trying to get a bunch of things done, like Logan was having some TV time, and so I was on my computer frantically trying to get shit done. Is this gonna turn into a fight before we go to our dinner? I don't think so. Okay. Um, and I was feeling, and this was not your intention, I was feeling like you were really trying to like get some kind of acknowledgement or recognition from me, right? You were trying to connect with me She's emotionally, up. I see yeah, her. Yeah. And I could have either leaned into that and given it back to you, but felt annoyed and resentful about it. Mm -hmm. I could have not said anything and felt annoyed and resentful in my body, or I could have done what I did, which is, hey, can you give me some like emotional love instead of like this kind of mm -hmm. sexual energy love? Mm -hmm. And you said, yes, I can do that. And I'll tell you, it felt really good because that's me owning my part. In that moment, it had nothing to do with you and how much I loved you and desired you and all these things. I was feeling a little like Ugh, by that energy because that's not where my head was. I could have ignored that feeling and made myself feel like shit, made you feel like shit in, in return. But instead I was just very clear and very kind and I was like, this is what I want. And you were like, yeah. And that completely changed how that could have gone. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So that is me taking radical ownership of like, don't just suck it up and don't say anything. Don't just lean in and pretend because that's what he might want and then be resentful. That's on you, meaning me, right? So can I flip it? If I was sure. in, a, in a space where I felt um, like I needed connection, can I express that? Like you express you needing space? Would that be fair or no? It's always fair to express what you need but then it has to stop there without the expectation that the other person will give you what you need. Yeah. So once it turns into an expectation that the other person acts accordingly, that's where it gets tricky, right? So you could have gotten upset, of course, but I actually noticed in you a totally different response than I think I was saying in my head was gonna be the response. If I say this to him, he's gonna get upset. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to just yeah. be honest. I mean, I think the... That's the codependency work. Yeah, and I think the, the thing that the rewiring piece is um, her having a habit of thinking if I express my need, the sky's going to fall, yes. it's going to be a fight. So then my, my focus would be to create a space where she expresses her need and then to make it safe. And it doesn't become a fight, uh, which then reconditions her body to believe, oh, I can actually express myself and I won't get pushed back, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thousand of those experiences um, yes. for then, each other. So for over, her, mm -hmm. and then, you know, also for me with our dynamic, uh, mine would be to actually express that I need connection or need, you know, a hug or whatever it is. And for her to hear me and, you know, what she does with that is on her. Mm -hmm. um, but if I feel like I don't want to be needy, so I never express that, mm -hmm. then it turns into kind of resentment, or it may turn into me being like, all right, I don't even want it, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. that doesn't help at all, so. And I think you did need connection, right? And you were, you were having a bid for a connection in that moment. And I think 
I was able to give you connection in my way, right? Like I gave you the connection that I felt comfortable giving to you and it felt like we actually really connected in that moment and it felt good. Yeah. Because it wasn't laced with anything. There was no undertone of resentment Don't or like, me. I'm, <laughs> I'm giving you what you need against my kind of will, right? Which is the codependent. Uh, you know what's have. you know what's great about this example, which by the way is true, and it just happened hours Somebody ago. Somebody actually just said too, this is really relevant. Like I know this is something yeah. people can resonate with. Um, what I find that's helpful for this example is um, we're talking about something very subtle, mm -hmm. right? We're not talking about me demanding something or her it so busy. Fight it's or... just very subtle. You know, it's a what is it, Sunday, Saturday, mm -hmm. Saturday, Sunday. Saturday. Sunday. Oh, it's Sunday. Sorry, <laughs> it's a Sunday afternoon. We're just doing life. And, and, you know, there's always a cadence and a dance when it comes to affection and love, um, especially if you speak different love languages, especially if you have, you know, different levels or whatever, what you feel that you need. And so that's something that we are constantly working on. And even in the nuance of her on the computer and me, it's not like I was groping her. No. I mean, I was touching her back. I was it, I, The energy in the room was kind of like needing, right, needing to be close and then her being busy and kind of occupied um, to subtly... How do I say this? To subtly um, maneuver or transition that cadence, that step in a way where people are not stepping on toes and getting angry, right? So, well, but here, can I just really quick? The only reason I'm going to say on that is because what I mean we, is we, it, can't, we didn't scream at each other. No, 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 of course, but I can't, I can't control how you would have responded to what I just did right in that moment. So I don't, I don't necessarily think I maneuvered no, to make sure you didn't get angry. That's not what that's I'm saying. Not that's not what I'm saying. So by you expressing what you needed yes. in a kind way, yes. that was the, the subtlety. That was the gentleness. That was the maneuvering. Yes, I agree. All right? I'm, the only reason I'm saying that is because I think there most likely are people that are listening who would say, well, it doesn't matter how kind I am, somebody's still gonna be angry with me, right? Because I feel like I hear that all the time. Because you're looking at it through like a the and, codependency thing, Well, my right? point right. is you do it no matter what because the alternative There's is- There's someone named Vanessa Barnett. <laughs> Barnett, <laughs> <laughs> holy shit. Um, oh, you might think my camera's Like you do it no matter what because the alternative is to be inauthentic and then carry that resentment. What I, what I meant was you didn't turn around and say, get the fuck off well, me. I'm busy, you know? Course, so like, yeah. so that's what I mean, like the nuance in everyday life and how something's so subtle uh, because it wasn't a big deal. Um, but, but I did sense, I did sense when you looked at me cause you made eye contact, I did sense like, Hey, I, here's an ask from me. Here's what I, I really, so I, it's I did. Clear. Yeah, it was, it was clear. It was direct. It wasn't, I always say clear, kind, concise. Those are your only three yeah. things you need to make sure of when yeah. you're communicating. Be clear, be kind, be concise. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's just an example. It's being adults. Yeah. It's being emotionally adults, which most of us, uh, including my, my son, we're, which we, we struggle with because we weren't raised that way. Very few of us had um, parents who were adults. Uh, most of us were raised by people who looked like adults, but were emotionally immature. Yeah. And so the generational transmission process, the effects of that as we grow up, um, are show up more than ever or more than in anything in relationships yeah. right that's where they glow so then to do what you want with that take responsibility and try to be more adult and immature which is very very hard to do it's not an easy thing to do you know mm -hmm. um, but that's where you change that's where the road forks that's where you change the dynamic um, all right we gotta go so one more time for anybody who came in late Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents by Lindsay Gibson. That's the book we we're talking about. Yeah. Happy holidays. Be well. Oh, said goodbye, but we're all walking to the car still. <laughs>